All right, my friends, welcome back. It is time for another Motor Week Retro Review Reaction, and this week it is the 1995 Ford Contour and Mercury Mystique. I'm really excited about this one because I like these cars, and I remember looking at them when they were brand spanking new. And ultimately, they ended up not being the hit that I think Ford needed or wanted them to be, and I think there's four reasons for that. Maybe five. But let's see what Motor Week said about it when it was brand spanking new. So, uh, as always, sit back in your comfy chair, grab your beverage of choice, and today it is caffeinated but cold. So, it's not that great. And also, I will apologize up front. I do have a little bit of a head cold, so if you hear me sniffling, I apologize. But let's get into it. Motor Week is made possible by Auto Value and Bumper to Bumper and TireRack.com. World cars are nothing new to the Ford Motor Company. They tried the concept in the early 80s with the Escort. But their desire to design one car for the whole world didn't quite work out. It seems not all cultures wanted the exact same car. Well, now Ford's going global again with this car, the Contour Family Sedan. And this time, nothing was lost in the translation. And that's good news, because Ford plans to sell its CDW27 world car in 75 countries. And Ford needs to serve up 700,000 of them annually to recoup its $6 billion development cost. But that investment has already paid big dividends, with Ford's Mondeo sedan, hatchback, and wagon winning Europe's 1993 Car of the Year award. Here in the U.S., buyers can choose between the Ford Contour and its more conservatively styled sibling, the Mercury Mystique. And I'm going to interrupt him there for our first break because uh, I'm glad they brought it up the way they did. Um, various manufacturers have done world cars, and the reason for wanting to do it is obvious. If you put in the development for a car and you sell it in one country, like America or Europe... You're only spreading it around that number of cars, that development cost. But if you can spread that development cost over all the cars around the world, well, either you can lower the price of the car or make more profit. Unfortunately, it never seems to really work out. Now, of course, the Beetle was a world car. They brought up the Escort. That's another good option. Unfortunately, a lot of these world cars ended up being a world car, but then had to be tailored for the specific markets to the point it was almost a different car to begin with. And Ford dove into this again and came up with an incredibly expensive platform that I don't think it ever quite, at least in the U.S., ever quite lived up to its potential. And again, I think it's been, it was hamstrung for a reason. Stylistically wise, uh, I think these are good looking cars. I really do. Uh, I'm a fan of the 90s, and this is one of the more memorable 90s cars to me. Um, I do actually like the Mercury a little bit better, and I want to credit Ford Corporation for actually making it look different. Sure, the, the body shell and everything else is pretty much the same, but at least from the front, at least they don't look like copies of each other with just a different logo. I thought that Ford did a pretty good job here. The contour, I think it's neat, and I think it's tidy, and I like how they stretch the the sheet metal around. It looks like a very taut car to me, to my eyes. What I never loved about it was the front. Now, I think the headlights are fine. They're not too big. They're not squinty. But the grill, or lack of it, it's just a hole. I don't know. Just It, it lacks a little pizzazz in the front. Other than that, handsome car handsome, really, really good-looking car, in my opinion. But each will come only as a four-door sedan. However, 90% of the parts under the skin are the same around the world. Contours come in three trim levels, Base GL, Volume LX, and our favorite, the Sporty SE. Mystique grades are GS and LS. All sport cab forward styling, four-valve per cylinder engines, and meet all safety requirements through 1998. Our focus here is the Contour, whose curvy hood includes an oval grille opening that continues a recent Ford styling trend. Nice, but not as adventuresome as we'd like. Overall exterior dimensions almost match the Honda Accord, which says volumes about Contour's mission. 
Rear styling has a pronounced import influence with organic shaped tail lamps and a chrome bumper insert to match the one up front. And I think the rear of this ends up looking um, really good. They, they, it's got a little bit of a hint of Oldsmobile Alero in it. But I think that they really resisted the temptation to pull it in, to pull the sides in more, or to slope the trunk down, uh, make this more stylish, uh, kind of like the Infiniti J30 was. And instead, they went with a little more squared off. I, I think it works. I think it works, and I think it looks really good, again, if not quite earth-shattering. Base Contour Power Plant is the all-new ZTEC 2-liter 16-valve dual overhead cam 4-cylinder. It produces 125 horsepower, or more than 1 horsepower per cubic inch, and 125 pound-feet of torque. We found its bottom end stronger than most 2-liter motors, even when mated to this U.S.-designed 4-speed automatic transmission for its first fully electronic unit. Our preliminary 0 to 60 times of 11 seconds improves to 9.1 seconds with the standard 5-speed manual, an also all-new unit developed by Ford of Germany. But even better engine news is Contour's 2.5-liter all-aluminum Duratec V6. Ford's U.S. engineers had help from Porsche and Cosworth during its development, and it shares some architecture with Ford's modular V8. Look for a 3-liter version of the V6 and the next Ford Taurus. Duratec's 24 valves and dual overhead camshafts help produce 170 horsepower and 165 pound-feet of torque. But it felt like more because 90% of it can be tapped at a very low 1500 RPM. Yeah, you know, interesting. Um, I have no problem with these engines. Uh, if you are, you know, one of my viewers who are mechanics, uh, you might have something to say about the Z-Tech, right, or the Duratec. But um, overall, I have no problem with these engines. They're not earth-shattering, um, certainly, because this car's 30 years old now, right? So hearing a V6 make 170, you're like, eh, you know. But these were good numbers, and um, this car was not a sports car, but it had a, a sporty focus, much more like what you would get with a European car, and I think these engines were kind of in line with it. Um, I drove both, and the, the V6 was fun, but again, for me, I probably would just gotten the four cylinder because I'm not, you know, going anywhere fast. That contributes to a zero to 60 time of nine seconds with the automatic and a spirited 7.5 seconds with the five speed. Both powertrain combinations provide smooth power delivery. We were equally impressed with the Contour's excellent road grip and feel. Power rack and pinion steering and anti roll bars are standard on all models. The all-independent suspension features struts up front and Ford's Quadralink setup in the rear modified to provide some passive rear steering. This keeps the tail nicely stable in corners, even when too much throttle is released too quickly. The suspension and chassis setup came from Ford of England with the help of three-time Formula One champ Jackie Stewart, while Dearborn engineers worked on ride quality, which is also very good. Four-cylinder contours have front disc, rear drum brakes. V6-equipped cars get disc all around. Both an anti-lock system and an all-speed traction control system are available on all models, a first in this class. Contour's airy interior is clean. Before, before they go on to the interior, um, you know, one of the things that is most memorable about this car is just how good it felt when you drove it. Um, it... it might be a little bit of heresy, but it felt like a more premium car than it than it really was. Uh, the, the engines were fine. The transmissions shifted well. I drove both the automatic and the uh, the five speeds back in the day, and it was widely praised for its handling. In fact, I think it was Car and Driver uh, that positively compared it to BMW. <laughs> it's a, this was a strong package, and I do like how they broke down that Ford leveraged its resources to pull areas of expertise into the car. Um, very interesting, but that was one of the major strengths of this. Clearly driver-oriented with a European flair. Cloth upholstery is standard. This SE has optional leather. Though limited in number, the sharp analog gauges jump out from their pod. Naturally, dual airbags are foremost among the safety features. 
but they also include the well-bolstered bucket seats which ride on ramps that help prevent submarining under the dash in an accident. Even the base GL seats offer good support. The LX and SE seats feature a variety of adjustments including lumbar. The tilt wheel release lever is very stiff and Ford is delaying its availability until a fix can be made. Power window and door lock controls blend neatly into the driver's door panel while the turn signal and high beam stock is smaller than in previous U.S. Fords. The CFC free air conditioning system is activated via three super easy to use rotary knobs. Standard is a new air filtration system that removes most pollen and dust. Usually found only on luxury cars, it's a first for this class. So finally you don't have to be rich to breathe clean air. The bottom of the rear seat is high enough for good comfort and visibility, but headroom does suffer. Legroom is typical for this size sedan. Trunk space is untypically large at 13.9 cubic feet. And the split rear seat backs fold down from the rear via a pair of trunk mounted releases. You know what? This is, this is all really, really impressive. Um, I truly had forgotten how much I like that interior. Uh, it's, a, it's a little dreary inside but overall i mean the gauges are clear the ergonomics look fine i like the dash uh in front of the passenger um dual airbags uh the 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 safety pr help prevent submarining underneath the dash uh poles in the trunk there's a lot of really they this is a car that they sweated the details and it shows this is not another American car where they just said, oh, let's just do what we've always done, you know, we'll improve it, you know, 2%, and then we'll send it out with a new body. This this is a solid, solid entry. Um, very interesting, because I don't, I don't remember 30 years ago looking at this car and being like, wow, this is all pretty impressive. I remember looking at it and thinking, wow, finally... They have something competitive with the Accord. Now, I expected something to be said about the back seat or the front seat and how much space there was, but everything they said was extremely positive. Front seat, the back seat looked roomier than I remember, actually. I'm not sure they didn't play with the front seat location there. And then the trunk. Um, interesting. Prices start at $13,310 for the base Contour GL. The V6 option adds about $1,000 to GL and LX Contours. ABS another $565 and traction control $800 more. The Contour SE begins at $15,695 and includes the V6. We think that's a world of value wrapped in a very impressive package. In fact, we can't remember when we were so impressed with a quote unquote family car. And we're not alone. Automobile Magazine says, The Contour is equivalent to a best-selling book that has been translated into a dozen foreign languages. We like the Contour, and you can quote us in any language. Clearly, Ford's engineers all over the globe are now speaking the same language, and it's one that all car enthusiasts can easily understand. Wow, that was way more positive than I thought it was going to be. Um, and honestly, what it, this for me was a great trip down memory lane because this came out and another car came out. I'll talk about it in a second. And I drove them literally back to back, right? Leave one dealership, go to the other one. And they were both strong in completely different ways. And this car, I don't know its sales numbers. I'll look it up when I'm done here. But overall... The Contour ended up being kind of a disappointment, at least in the United States, from a sales perspective. And the biggest reason why was that while it handled great, it was small. And that, I said at the beginning, I think there's four reasons that this car, I don't want to use the word failed, but that it didn't succeed, runaway success like maybe you would be thinking. And those reasons are the Honda Accord, the Toyota Camry, and the Chrysler Cirrus, or the, the Chrysler Cloud cars. The fourth one was the size. And let's start with the size, because Europeans don't want 
big cars. They don't want huge cars. They don't have necessarily, in some locations, the streets for bigger cars. So they had to make it tidy proportions. But that tidy proportion here in America put it at a disadvantage relative to the Camry, the Accord, and the Chrysler offerings. And that is the overwhelming thing I remember about reviews of this car, is it sounds good, it feels good, it drives good, but it's kind of small, overwhelmingly. Now, in hindsight, I've heard from multiple people when I've talked about these kind of cars before that they weren't. Uh, long-term durable. <laughs> they weren't. Uh, they weren't the most reliable in the longer term. Uh, I have no first-hand experience of that, so I'll take them at their word. And so you had a car that ended up being price competitive, but on the small side, and then ended up not being terribly reliable. Um, fun car. Fun car. Dang, I miss it. I'll, honestly, you know, for thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars, this car—I don't care what size it is. I don't care that it looks like an Escort. I'd buy it for fourteen thousand dollars today, because brand new, brand new. Because I think this is something critically missing in our marketplace right now, and I think this would sell. I really do. But I did say that two dealerships, right? I drove one of these, and I remember really liking it. But I also drove a Chrysler Cirrus at the same time. And both Ford and Chrysler decided to go right at the Honda Accord. They didn't try to come up with two models that bracketed it on each side, kind of like what GM did for a number of times. They decided to go right at the Accord and the Camry. And I will argue all day long that the Cloud Cars, the Cirrus, and the Dodge Stratus and the Plymouth Breeze, um, did it better. They're, they handled well, they handled competently, they, they had enough acceleration, but they were bigger inside. They had more, felt like more width, more space, bigger back seat. I also thought they were much, much better looking. And the fact of the matter was that for my money, as much as I like this Contour, I would have gone to a Dodge dealership. And I thought very, very seriously about it. But at the time, uh, my first wife and I, our finances, uh, my, my desires said Dodge Stratus. My finances said Neon. Okay. So, cool car, good car, love to see it again. But back in the day, the Chrysler offerings were just better. Thanks for being here, guys. Let me know what you think below. And as always, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. Thanks.